great to be back on what I consider to be home turf. We're going to do a little, um, we're going to do a little exercise first. We're going to send a time capsule to 2118. The reason I gave you the index card, what I want you to do is take, we're going to take a real short uh, time here, but try to think of one or two sentences, phrases, whatever, even if incomplete thoughts would be fine. What do you think that you can send to somebody of the future 100 years from now? Um, something to tell them about yourself, something to tell them about our time that we have here. Um, yeah. Uh, here's a couple of prompts if you need it too. These are some pre-done. Pre so, I mean, these are just some things to give you some thoughts. I'm not asking you to fill these forms out, but there are literally hundreds of these type of things online. But just take a couple of minutes here and let's think about something and jot it down and then hold on to it because we're going to get back to it later in the presentation. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. You can continue to, you know, if you think of your thought, if you haven't got it completed, um, you can go ahead and write it down during the presentation. We won't be collecting these till the end. There'll be a quiz, but. And, you know, college professor, I have to at least have some quiz as part of the, uh, part of the presentation. So we're going to talk a little bit about a brief, we're going to a little bit of brief overview of time capsules themselves. When you think of the word time capsule, we all kind of, I would imagine we all sort of have this predetermined thought that it is something that you actually like in the cartoon, somebody's actually burying in the background. They're trying to um, send, send or convey a message to the future. But the word time capsule itself actually has entered our lexicon um, and our popular culture in a lot of different ways. Um, and I could actually do a whole talk just on time capsules in, in general. There's so much information out there. But these are some different examples of, of time capsules. Of course, the uh, sort of the typical time capsule. Um, these were really big around the year 2000, 1999, 2000 with the millennium. Um, and that's when we saw a shift from a lot of these were things that were projected out into the future there, uh, you know, for 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. We started seeing a shift at that time to time capsules that were being buried for 50 and 25 years. Um, and a lot of it goes into the fact that people that buried them wanted to see them open because you put all your time and effort into that and you want to be able to see what's going to happen. That'll enter a little bit into our discussion about the, the Kennedy Peace Capsule. But that's the typical type of time capsule that we remember, although they come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, the one that you see up in the upper, your upper right-hand corner is actually the Westinghouse time capsule. It's the second incarnation of it. But that is 1938 World's Fair. Um, that was the first time that the word time capsule was actually used. Before that, they called them things like century safes and stuff like that. But that was actually when Westinghouse buried that. Um, it was purpose built. It was meant to go in the ground. It was, they did everything that they could do to try to preserve this material. And it was going to go for 5,001 years. So it's to be open in 6939. And it's rechristened Time Capsule 1, and there's actually a second one. If you see on this, I, you, you can see the 1965, that was the second capsule they buried. They're supposed to both be opened at the same time. Now, they've also, um, Jamestown actually has the distinction of being a time capsule. It's another term, time capsule can be used for a place that actually looks something, you know, Jamestown itself is a capsule of time. It's basically something that the time period is encapsulated in this area. So Jamestown's considered a time capsule, but it also has a time capsule buried specifically in 2007 at the 400th anniversary, I believe it was. They buried a time capsule in Jamestown, but that's not the only time capsule. There was a third time capsule that was actually found that the archaeologists digging back, or the archaeologists that were digging back in the 1900s had actually buried. Because remember, Jamestown has a really long history of people doing excavations. They actually buried a time capsule that the people found about the time they were getting ready for this 400th. So there are three time capsules in one area. It's kind of an interesting trifecta, so to speak. But that it also goes to show that there are things like archaeological sites and shipwrecks that can take on that term time capsule because you've encapsulated time, essentially. A time and a place that's been put in one spot. Um, I'm thinking even there's a, uh, there was a couple of years ago Somebody had opened a door to a, a Parisian apartment over in Paris that hadn't been touched, hadn't been occupied for at least 50 or 60 years. Might have even been longer than that. It might have been closer to 75. 
Nothing had been disturbed. So this was veritably a time capsule. When you opened it and entered the door, even the dust on the floor was part of the, the time capsule. So they, time capsules can literally be all these different things. The reason Andy War this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, Andy Warhol's time capsule. Andy Warhol, of course, was a big counterculture um, icon and pop culture um, artist, et cetera. He created a time capsule that he thought was as authentic as he could be, so he took a bunch of stuff from his desk and threw it in this capsule and had it buried. So somebody came up with the do-it-yourself Andy Warhol time capsule kit. I thought this was actually kind of hilarious when I saw it online. Um, because I'd done the research and found out about his whole time capsule. Um, but he's trying to be as authentic as he can be by burying just mundane stuff. So literally time capsules can have all kinds of different things buried in them. They can be purpose buried. They can be purpose buried with a distinct time frame like the Westinghouse, uh, the JFK that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Or they can be purpose buried and then um, not with a definite time frame, meaning that they can, you know, they might be opened by someone, and those are usually things like uh, boxes that are in monuments and things um, in cornerstones. <laughs> Typically, those are purpose buried, but they're non-specific date-wise. Then there's those non-specifically purpose buried things, which are capsules that just happen. Things like foundation deposits. You've heard of people putting stuff in the walls of a house, finding things when they're renovating. Mm -hmm. That's another type of time capsule, but that's non-specific because the stuff either fell in there or might have been just discarded. Uh, in some cases, there's rituals that go around. I mean, all of that. There's rituals actually going back in early time, dating with um, foundation stones that were buried and sacrifices that were made and things like that. So it, it, it's all this, it, once you really dig into it, it really becomes an interesting, um, interesting topic. But what we've, we're mostly dealing with a, in a lot in more recent times are these purpose buried specific time period types of time capsules. And in size, they vary. The Westinghouse capsule's not that big, relatively speaking, as say a car. This is a 1957 Plymouth Belvedere. If you want an interesting read, go on the internet and search Miss Belvedere. Oh. It's a car that was the Tulsa Rama, which was Tulsa, Oklahoma's um, big uh, celebration. They buried this time capsule in 1957. It's a brand new 57 Plymouth Belvedere. Mm -hmm. And they buried it and they also put, you can see there's the time capsule that went with it. So it's a time capsule within a time capsule. And here it is going in the ground on the, on the right. Here it is when they went to dig it up. Full of rust. Full of rust. <laughs> they coated it with this thing called cosmoline and they put it with all kinds of plastic sheeting and all of this. They actually put gasoline in there because they didn't know if we were going to have gasoline to, to run this thing. Because, you know, they're predicting, they're predicting into the future. This is only, only 50 years. So, interestingly enough, it, um, it, it, it did make its way to a museum. Um, it, it didn't make it to any of the big museums because nobody wanted to have to take on that. So it ended up in some museum. I've been trying to track it down, but it, it, they didn't have anything um, on this particular. The car is not listed online or anything like that. So it's um, not one of the. It's probably still in progress, but it needed to be totally rebuilt if they were going to make it um, stand the test of time because it's completely rusted. So this water is going to be a theme that we'll we'll talk about a little bit as we go. And. Of course, like I said, it entered our popular culture lexicon and it's entered our vocabulary to mean a couple different things. It's like the word in museums, the word curator. Curator used to mean a specific type of job, a specific person that did the job um, related to museums or art galleries, that type of thing. Well, now the word curate online takes on a very different connotation. It's the same way that time capsule does. I mean, anybody can curate a page or things like that and it, it doesn't have quite that same connotation in today's vocabulary. Same thing with the word time capsule. This is a hard drive. Basically, it's an Apple hard drive that you can put your family pictures on, but they're calling it a time capsule. And then recently, um, just as I was getting, in the fall, I was getting ready to do the, um, doing some of the background research on this, I ran across your time capsule, which is Spotify. Are you familiar with Spotify? It's a music streaming service. Uh, kind of like um, Pandora, I think, is another one. But it's, um, you can actually, if you have stuff from your childhood that you want to have, you know, say your high school memories and you want to have all those songs on there, 
that's what your time capsule's for. It's basically you give them the year and, and then you help select those songs. It becomes your personal time capsule. So the, the word has literally ended up in, in our vocabulary, meaning lots of different things than what we actually think it does. Um, one of the things you really want to make sure, though, when you're actually burying a time capsule is to make sure you mark it. Lots of time capsules are unmarked. They may be out there somewhere. And we wouldn't have known about the JFK capsule because it wasn't marked. There's one sitting, I think, very, very short ways from where that was, a very little marker put there, and that was put in the bicentennial. And I forget when it's supposed to be opened. But they at least marked that one, but they didn't mark the JFK, which was much larger. Um, although the burned grass around it every summer uh, tended to show the outline of it. And they didn't realize what was buried under there, but we'll get to that in a minute. So, of course, we're going to get to that. Bay City in 1965. Here they are burying the, the JFK time capsule. And I had a two minute video. I can't get the. Hi, my name is Ron Bloomfield. I'm the director of the Bay County Historical Society. Found out this year that the Bay County Historical Society actually owns a time capsule called the Kennedy Peace Capsule. It was supposed to have been opened 100 years from 1965, but we, uh, the, the people that helped us bury it, which were uh, the Bay County, I can actually show you the letter right here, the um, Bay County Labor Council conveyed the time capsule. We helped them stock it with information back at the time of the last centennial, which was this was September of 1965, uh, when the city had its centennial. Now that we're at the sesquicentennial, which is 150 years of the city, uh, they felt that at that time uh, they would like to see it opened in 50 years rather than 100. So that's why we're discussing opening, you know, exhuming it from the ground and opening this time capsule to see what's in there. There's a picture of what the time capsule looked like when it was being placed. We're standing right on the spot. You can see the outline on the ground. Yeah, could you kind of show folks exactly where is that? It's sort of that this faded rectangle in the grass faded here. Rectangle right here is a crypt. That was it was a vault that was built. It's several blocks high, um, and this box, which is, is quite large, as you can see the size of the, it's yeah. probably five feet by three feet. And what's down in there? Um, that's a good question. We know there's something called letters to t letters for tomorrow or letters to tomorrow, which I believe are to descendants of people that could actually people at the time could pay a certain amount of money. I think it was a dollar, and they could submit one of those. I know there's a series of those in there. Um, the historical society put a series of uh, pamphlets and newspapers on um, stuff like that as well, talking about the the city centennial at the time, and I think there was stuff from the county centennial, which was in, in 1957, was also put in there as well. Um, and beyond that, it's going to kind of be a, an interesting little, uh, um, almost like a uh, archaeological dig. <laughs> you never know what you're going to unearth next. Well, it was put together by the um, the labor unions at the time, and the United Labor Council put this together as a way to honor labor's contribution. It was the 65 was the Bay City Centennial, so the city, not the county, which was in 57, but the city centennial. So it originally was supposed to be buried on city hall property, but there was some discussion, dispute maybe might be a better word about where it was going to end up, and it finally ended up on the county building grounds. So it was buried on that front lawn, and every year it seemed like that front lawn would get that nice little outline of this big, now this thing was huge. If you look at the size of the people compared with it, it's six foot by four foot by three foot, big box. And it was built by the steel workers, uh, the boat builders union at, or the shipbuilders union local at Delta, or at Defoe Shipbuilding Company. So they built this and it was completely sheathed in lead. This lead was a, ship, a shipbuilding material that they used. They sealed it completely, um, thought it was gonna be waterproof and you'd think shipbuilders would know how to build it to be waterproof. Um, that's been the running joke, unfortunately, that's gone as well. When we found it was completely compromised, um, you'd think shipbuilders. Of course, they have bilge pumps to keep the water out, so they, maybe they're not so um, concerned about making sure it's 100% waterproof. They did try waterproofing the stuff on the interior, um, but that didn't work so well either. Okay, here's us the day of the actual ex exhumation. This was back in uh, September of 2015. We petitioned the county to allow us to have help. And honestly, had the county not provided us with that help, we wouldn't have been able to raise this thing out of the ground. Because A, 
it was huge and it was lead and wood and everything with all the contents inside of it. But with all that water in there, that backhoe that you see right here was struggling to get that thing out of the ground. It couldn't lift it all the way up where it needed to be. And of course, we thought we were going to probably be able to get it out of the ground, bring it in here maybe. Um, that, that minute it, the minute we saw the problem that we had with it, there was no way we were going to get it in here. So it had to go out to the county, um, county uh, uh, rec store out at the fairgrounds. <coughs> so here's, here's the vault after it's been removed. You can see our little problem there in the bottom of that. There's some water. It's not a great photograph, but it, it does show you that there, there was wet. This is probably, between these two packages, we're sitting on top of the vault inside of this where it's buried on it. And it wasn't very, buried very far underground. But these are probably the instructions. <laughs> they're still in the freezer. They're in the bottom. And they're probably not going to be salvageable. But here it is on the back of the truck because we had no way to transport this thing. We'd actually brought a small trailer, but we had no way to transport it. So um, the county offered to put it on the truck, take it over there. So the next day we went out. Here we are. Um, now there is video, uh, thanks to Nick from Bay TV. He uh, did a compilation, and you can find it online if you search with, under JFK Time Capsule. I usually, when I do the presentations, I play a little bit of it, but um, with the technology issue right now and the fact that I've got some other cool stuff to show you um, about the, the actual letters. I'm not going to show those right now. We actually cut into this with a, with a, had to cut into it with a circular saw, but we had to drill some pilot holes first. Uh, how many were there? I should ask. Was anybody? I know Emily and Kareen. Okay. Wow. So this is all new. Okay. Cool. So if you get a chance, it's cool. Be cool to watch that on, uh, um, on YouTube. Here we are with the circular saw. It's Gordon uh, Kuklis on staff here and myself trying to figure out how we're going to get this thing open. You can see, um, well, in this picture, you can see a little bit of the lettering that was on. If you remember that earlier photo, it said John F. Kennedy Peace Capsule. Of course, it was named John F. Kennedy Peace Capsule because this was in the height of when all of the, you know, after his assassination, there were lots of things named in his honor. Um, but then when we opened it, this is what we found. You got water, and this had actually drained out, been draining for about 24 hours before we opened it. So it was pretty full up almost to the top. And this is all groundwater that seeped through sheet lead that was quarter inch thick and into whatever this creosote or some other kind of um, tarry substance that they used to coat part of this. So there were lots of environmental toxins in there of some form or another. Uh, you can see up here was another shot of it up underneath. This is the, this being the top and where we cut the hole. And then you can see us pulling. Now, if, you, if this were better, you could see the, um, the, the water dripping off that plate. This is a, they, <laughs> it looked like they had a bunch of souvenir stuff left from the 65 centennial that they just threw in. And so there's this big box of those souvenir plates, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Your uh, Bay City, 100 years of port. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, but they're unfortunately, they're all environmentally compromised because they were sitting in that water and it tends to soak that stuff up. We were able to find a few things. Initially, this is one of the Bay City Centennial ties. Okay. Um, so there's one of those string ties that you could find. And then here we are. Here's a grinder, a coffee grinder. They threw in a few additional. Um, the museum had to, had to help pack up some of the, or the Historical Society had to help pack up some of the, the space. So they threw in a couple of extra pieces. I don't know if they got these on donation or something like that, but there's an old coffee grinder. Um, I think these were wallpaper samples or something that we were looking at. There was um, just an interesting group of things floating in this material. Here we are. We found a couple packets that were still viable. Most of them, when you pulled them up, they had all kinds of water in them. But this one, you can see the, the ugly color of the water staining. But the plastic actually on some of these held up pretty good. And I'll read an excerpt from a couple of the letters we found. It turns out the, the ones that needed to be saved um, with the exception of the letters to tomorrow, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes, were the ones that really was good that they did get saved, um, the, because it was the letter from Ira Butterfield, who was the president of the society at that time, telling about, A, what the project was, and it's a letter for my future friends, and the second one, um, which actually I can, I can read, I should be able to see this. The second letter, he sent the first letters to the friends of the future and talks about things like the space race and stuff like that at the time and how, you know, we hope that things are well for you. But then he includes a second letter 
That does say to our friends of the future, but I think this was more to the people that opened the time capsule because they were probably, he knew they'd be scratching, we'd, we'd be scratching our heads wondering what the heck. Um, so he said, the Bay, I'm gonna paraphrase some of this, but the Bay County Labor Council, which promoted this time capsule, maintained no direct contact with the Bay County Historical Society until the capsule was actually turned over to that society on September 7th at five o'clock p.m. We of the Historical Society have were never consulted nor told what would be included other than letters being inserted by individuals at a dollar each. We only knew when we were to receive the custody of the capsule and what was printed by what was printed in the newspaper. It is obvious to us that this is not the result of the, any intent to bypass the historical society since the union officials appear to have been keenly interested in the historical significance of their project but it does demonstrate an interesting failure to communicate. So basically he's saying, and then he goes on to talk about that there was a space about three foot by three foot by two foot left that the Historical Society had to fill. So they were trying to put in uh, current magazines, um, something about stuff about the Kennedy administration and the Bay City Centennial uh, celebration items, stuff on the Catholic churches. Unfortunately, a lot of that stuff probably didn't make it at all except for the plates. Um, and then they wanted to try to get a better cross-section of the community by including materials, commerce and industry, communications, civic and social, things like that. So basically, he's saying we didn't have a lot of time to do this, we had to scramble to put all this stuff in here. So, here you go. <laughs> Not having an inventory made this extremely hard, but that letter did indicate one thing, because this is actually like a, this is like an archeological investigation. We don't know anything except that these letters possibly existed. Um, so now we know the letters existed. We know that they were supposedly paying about a dollar a piece, but we, we don't know anything additional about what else is supposed to be in there except what we're finding and trying to piece back together. So we found that these packets were a couple of the packets that were viable. Everything else ended up in the freezer. Um, we had, there were some union materials that made it as well. Uh, Gordon's holding the slide rule, which actually is plastic and did clean up fairly well, except for the little, it has a pencil sharpener, and the little uh, blade on it rusted. But other than that, the plastic was halfway decent shape. We, we did the cleanup, and then a couple days, well actually it was over a week later that Gordon and I were able to get back to it. The county stored it in one of the outside they, they had to move it out of the bay, put it into one outside uh, storage unit, brought it back in, and so this stuff has been ruminating in there for a while. And we ended up with uh, cleaning out the rest of it, and then we had to cut the side off of it. So here's the capsule, this side's been cut off. This is cellulose, filled with all kinds of other nasty stuff. The letters to tomorrow that we found were buried right in this area amidst all of the cellulose in a, pl in a metal container. These were those letters that they talked about. So they'd been sitting in there for that long on top of the time they'd been completely submerged in water. I mean, if you can guess, the, the water likely came in from the bottom, so they were probably sitting in there the majority of the time that the water was in. And that water was likely in there for a very long time. So my thought is within a couple years of it being put in, it started leaking. Um, and so it's a good thing we opened it at 50 years, even though we did even though it was prescribed by the Labor Council that we open it, instead of 100 years, they came back to the society after, I think it was two or three years, and said, we'd like to make sure that people see, that are here have a chance to see this opened. So can we have you open it in 50 years instead of 100? And that was voted on and approved by the Historical Society. Um, and then when we found it, we didn't find out about this until 2015, uh, that we owned it, which is the year we were supposed to open it. So we had to scramble a little bit to do that. And then of course we took a whole bunch of flack by the trolls on the internet about why you opened it after 50 years. You know, there were some pretty <laughs> lewd and crude comments on there, unfortunately. But it is, a good, it is a good thing that we opened it after 50 years because after 100, my guess is the stuff wouldn't have even been, you know, been viable. You take another 50 years sitting in that stuff, it wouldn't have been good. So, and interestingly enough, they were ahead of the trend because like I told you earlier in the presentation, 50 years and even 25 years are now the norm, it seems like, on a lot of these purpose-built time capsules. So, the unfortunate part, most of the families, the people that actually buried this stuff, are, at this point, not around. 
their kids might be, or I know their kids are actually, because there were several that showed up. But a lot of the families are probably still around, but they're descendants of, they're not the people that actually buried it. We couldn't find hardly anybody, well, we couldn't find anybody at all. In fact, I know Bob Chersnevsky had passed shortly before, and he was one of the individuals standing around it. He was part of the Historical Society. And he passed, I think, a year before we, so I couldn't even pick his brain about it. And Ira Butterfield died in 1994. He would have been a good one, too, because he, he had a mind like a steel trap. He, he remembered all kinds of things. Um, and it was unfortunate I wouldn't, but we didn't know about it at the time. So this is what we're stuck with. We ended up having that stuff just had to be shoveled out, and that's all we could do. So we got the salvage going. I'm going to move quickly through some of these to get to the good stuff. There were some 3D objects that were found, a pair of uh, plastic um, celluloid glasses uh, that had bifocals on them, and the bifocals separated because they were the glue, they were glued in. You know, sad iron, things like these. These are all in water because that's the protocol for trying to salvage this type of material. The unfortunate part is that a lot of it was already too far gone. As you'll see, this was a glasses case for another set of glasses that were in there that's totally disintegrated. This is a bad photo of a, um, a straight razor. Uh, the, the shell part of the, the celluloid part of the, of the case was still okay, but the razor itself was completely pitted and rusted and everything. This is what some of it looked like. Um, the little coins are just the souvenir coins they handed out at the um, uh, Centennial. And then there's bits and pieces. We were wondering what these little curved things were. They're, they're, you know, they start off here and they go around like this. Anybody have an idea? It's like a little, little hook. It's a metal hook. Think about things that you might put clothes on. Um, Wooden clothes hangers. Um, yeah. All that's left is oh, the hook. Wow. So once we figured that out, it made a little more sense. Because there, there was clothing in there, but there's no clothing at all. There was a couple cufflinks and part of a little cuff left, and that was it. And of course, we found some really weird anomalies. The, there was a light, an old light bulb, and the base needed to be treated a little bit, but the bulb itself was actually in pretty good shape. And then there was this, and we wondered what this was. It's a little, they wrapped a lot of stuff in aluminum foil, but it had this little brownish substance inside of it. Turns out it's tobacco. <laughs> and there was also a uh, pack of cigarettes in there as well. I forget the camels, I think, but um, they weren't viable to be saved. And I don't believe this, is, this was viable either. We were just wondering what it was. So then, of course, the big, the big thing we wanted to find were the paper items. And this, this is the material that we took and we triaged it and then we threw it in the chest freezer downstairs, which is one of those large chest freezers and is completely full um, to this point. And the, the good thing is once it's been thrown in the freezer, basically it stops the, the, the problem. You don't have to worry about the degradation. And it actually, if you see this right here, this is after it had been in there a year. Yep, that's the moisture. It's pulling the moisture out. Freeze drying it. Well, sort of, yeah. Uh, it's a little different process, but yes, it's um, basically collecting all that moisture on the inside. We cleaned that off back in April when I had my students here working on this project, and I was just down there today to pull out a set of these, and this has already started building up again. So there's a residual moisture in there, even though a lot of it had gone out. But this is what these look, the, you know, these we figured were the, the letters to tomorrow, even though there's no designator on them, except that when we went in and started looking, a couple of the, the packets did have this letter. That's the first time we knew that there was an actual pre-printed form that they put in there. And this is what the pre-printed form looked like. It's a, it's a bifold. Um, it's fairly small. In fact, uh, hold on. This is what one of the bricks of them looks like. This is the un one of the unopened bricks. This is all letters to tomorrow. This is frozen, completely frozen. Cut double bagged in plastic trying to get that to wick out, and there's ice crystals forming inside of this. But there's also all that environmental bad stuff in there, which is why it's sealed. But this is, I'll leave this up here. It should be okay through the presentation if you want to look at it. I wouldn't recommend touching, but if you want to look at it on your way out just to see what it is. But there's probably 100 letters to tomorrow in there. So what we ended up doing, you can see a pack. This is one of the smaller packets right here, too. And this is some of the other stuff. We did find a packet of material within that group that had some stuff from Messiah Lutheran Church. Some of it was viable, some of it wasn't. Some was pre-printed things. We weren't as interested in that stuff as we were in the actual remembrances and handwritten stuff. So we did start looking at this back in, when was that, uh, Corrine? Um, 
November. We started looking at this back in November just to do a preliminary search to see if there was enough there. And keep in mind that had been two, almost two years, or had been two years since this stuff went in the freezer. And we did find in one of the first packets a group of 3D items along with what was a letter to tomorrow, but as you can see it's pretty well um, shot. But it was, we could tell who it was from, Albert and Geneva Buck. And um, this is part of the Buck family as well, but it's a photograph. And interestingly enough, the problem with freezing material like this is that if you do have a plastic coated photograph or a photograph that's got that plastic RC type sheen on it and you freeze it, it adheres really well to the other stuff that's in there. That's, you have to weigh it at that point. It's like, do we not freeze it because of these items? In this case, there's probably a, maybe less than a dozen photographs in there. So it's out of however many hundred of these letters, it's, it's worth it to try to, to, to have to work around this. And we were able to then eventually, I have a picture later that'll show you, we were able to put it back in water and kind of move it and get it so that it unstuck sort of uh, well enough. But a lot of the stuff is gonna be in, in compromise. And I apologize as we go forward, these are my documentation photos. I haven't had a time, a chance to actually go into Photoshop and edit all of these. So we had to look at what our options were. And so we had to look at what mitigation techniques we had available. For paper, you can do things like air drying these are just some stock photos showing uh, some air drying scenarios that people have had. Uh, this is hurricane relief in a, um, when things got flooded out. I think this was a school library. You can set books and things like that if they're still viable on their side, and you can try air drying this stuff. You can also try freeze drying, which was brought up before, but the problem with freeze drying is that it can be a very expensive process to do. And it does take the item, it takes the, the uh, you have to freeze it first, and then it takes the water vapor, it takes the water right out from, it skips over that thawing stage and goes right from ice into vapor. And, but it can also have some issues with certain types of materials. Uh, these are two freeze dryers. I have one at CMU that right now is inoperable. It's been inoperable for a few years, but it's about this size. And then this is a commercial unit that they use for doing larger things. Um, and you see the differences with freeze drying. This is it's also called sublimination. And then air or desiccant drying, sometimes if you don't pat it, uh, weight it properly, you can end up with stuff like this. Some of the other things that we looked at were photographic techniques. Using enhanced photography, and um, I'm just looking now, also CT scanning, I found out from one of my students, um, which she's gonna look into for an upcoming class, uh, where they actually are looking at ab being able to, to use, I think it's CT scanning through one of those like packets to be able to see even what's in there and taking slices of it. So there's new technology. This is just using uh, pho photography with infrared uh, lenses and things like that, using filters, which we did a little bit of during the process. You can see this, this is unfiltered, this is filtered. You can see it brings out different highlights. We tried this, um, we haven't quite hit on the exact thing and I think it will be individually based on each individual item that we look at. Our, what we were attempting to do is document everything we can. The originals are likely going to have to be discarded because there's so many issues. We can go through, there's a process that you can use by using ethanol where you can go and clean uh, paper that has environmental issues. We were looking to ha possibly go through and do that on a couple of those so that you can kill a lot of that material but that there are just so many variables with that that we won't be able to look into doing that until we know what we have and what we want to save. And then it's going to be based on each individual item, including the ink and all that kind of stuff. That's where a conservator will probably come in, um, or at least getting my network of conservators to give me some advice. So part five, which is probably what is the most exciting part. These are our findings. So this, this is Walter Davenport. Anybody know Walter? Walter was in Bay City for a while. Okay. Walter, unfortunately, passed on. Found his obituary online. He was uh, 81 years old. He moved to Brighton after he was in Bay City. He was a uh, trooper with the state police and um, made it to, retired as a detective sergeant in 1987 after 26 years of service. He was into antique cars and a few other things. But Walter's significant in the fact that it was his letter to tomorrow 
he paid his dollar, he pay, probably paid his dollar and did his letter to tomorrow. And we found out some real interesting things from reading his letter to tomorrow. So he's a, it's, it's now 8, 10 p.m. Thursday, the 12th of August. This would have been 18, or 1965. It was a beautiful day, very warm. I'm a trooper with the Michigan State Police, have been since 2-2061. Today he's working the county fair in a recruiting effort, and he basically was writing this. So they had a booth at the county fair. This is how we found out one of the ways that they used to put these letters together was using county fair as a way to, to write these letters to get people to, to buy it. Now there were other ways as well, but it's very interesting to see how they would, would do this. Um, and he lists his, in this case, these forms were set to have a message and hi cousin was the greeting, but then they had the name and they wanted to know a mother's, a mother's family name, a maiden name, et cetera, uh, and then children's names. And he of course had Ger Geraldine and Wendy. Uh, on the back he talks about Wendy being, I believe she's deaf and was having um, really good training through the, the deaf school and things like that. She's listed, she has, as well as her sister, are listed in the obituary, so we know it's the same individual. But to be able to put a face to what somebody's writing in 1965 is really cool. Mm -hmm. And to know a little bit more about the process. So we're getting all these little bits and pieces of it as we go along. So I brought a group of students in um, the 13th of April, something like that, Any, or 20th of April, I think it was. We brought a group of CMU um, Museum Studies students, and a couple of these students are actually into, heading into master's degree and PhD programs in archives management. So it was really good for them to get to see this because a lot of archivists would just say, no, we don't want that stuff. We don't want to deal with any of that sort of thing. Um, the information you can glean from a project like this, to me, is worth the effort to go through and do this. It's worth wearing a respirator. It's worth having to sit underneath a noisy vent fan exiting all that stuff out of the building. It's worth it to be painstakingly trying to get this information pried apart because this is going to give us a really good example of what Bay City looked like in 1965. Not just what we read in the textbooks or hear from family members who may have been around. You're actually hearing what they felt at that moment, just like what you guys did. What, just what, like what you just wrote down. That was them back then. So here's the crew. And of course we worked with Karina and Emily from the Historical Museum here and uh, four, brought four of the students over, and including my grad assistant, Mitchell. Um, and we got, to, uh, we got to do some of this. So we divided them into two teams and we started looking. And we've got a, a list now of about 45 names within this that we've pulled out of this group so far. Um, and keep in mind, this stuff is still frozen when it comes out of the freezer, so we have to let it thaw a bit. And then we have to be careful about how we're trying to do it. And invariably, sometimes other pieces get stuck to other pieces and stuff happens. But for the most part, you get it all apart, try to photograph it as well, we, as well as we can. There's the ice I was talking about. This was after I pulled all the, chipped the ice off the side of the, the bucket. So there's quite a bit there. Of course, that has all kinds of nasty in it. So, um, and you see what happened. The, the cool thing is that this desiccates, like was brought up before, this desiccates in the freezer. So all that water's coming out and you can see where they're starting to peel apart. Although there are pockets stuck up inside of it, so that becomes the issue of trying to go through that material. Um, it, it's, it, it takes a while. Uh, the smaller packets aren't so bad, but the larger packets are, are, can be a little tough. So we did find, these are, um, this is the one I was telling you about. You saw the one that had that partially open with the picture inside of it from the Buck family. There it is open. I floated it back in some water and we tried to, we kind of gingerly pulled it open, but this is the Buck family. And interestingly enough, some of the, the Buck family actually, in my listing of families that contributed, or people that contributed, a lot of the, their individual kids wrote something as well as their own, their own letter. Um, and then uh, there was a packet that one of the groups found, Emily, I think you worked with Emily, yeah, you worked with Courtney and Joanna on this one, didn't you? Yeah, yeah they found a packet that was, actually it's really cool, it's um, the bylaws from the, the shipbuilding, uh, shipbuilders union, this was a union packet, and inside of it is this flyer of a Defoe uh, employee's picnic, which was, you know, it, it mostly made it out okay. Uh, and there was some other literature, there were a couple of things in there unfortunately that were pretty degraded, but you see how this, this was red once upon a time, but the red bled all over the place. 
This is a sampling of, from foil packet six of some of the ones that we were able to pull apart. You know, obviously they're not in great shape, but the information is what we're looking for. This was a, a couple of pennies were taped in. There's one there that seemed to make it pretty good, but then there's one here. You can't see it very well in the photo, but it actually separated. So that intrigued one of my students. They're gonna go back and see about doing some research on why would that have separated? Was it because it was in the water or because it was frozen? Or because it was in the water and then frozen? So there could be some very interesting things about that. Because the interesting part about this is we know the duration of time that it was in the ground. We can estimate that it was at least 40 years probably in water, if not more. We know the types of materials that would have come in through the outside. Um, so we have a theoretically would know what's in the water, the bad quality of the water. And then we know how long it's been in the freezer because we documented all that material. So we, this is a, an ongoing experiment. This was another find that we had. This was a, uh, it's a religious card of some kind. Um, the ink, for some reason, seems to have been caustic because it actually bled into m multiple pieces on this. And there are types of inks, um, printer's inks. There's one called Iron Gall that will typically, it's older, although they still use it for certain things, where it will actually, over time, eat into the paper. So it looks like something's been chewing on the paper, but in, in reality, it's the ink eating away at the paper. I don't know that that's what we've got going on here, but we certainly had something going on because it, it, um, that outline was through various ones in that stack. <coughs> this was one, there was a lady um, named Esther Dunning, um, whom I happened to have met when I was here uh, working. She's been gone mm, quite a few years, but she's a rel relative of the Parsons family from Linwood, the recipe for a community, if anyone's familiar with the book that's in the gift shop. Um, that we have the diaries here from the uh, Myra Parsons uh, the, the diaries of Myra Parsons and the founding of the Linwood. Uh, and this is one of the family members. So she wrote in here with some of her family information. And of course we have Esther Parsons was the maiden name. Um, another one, this was an interesting one. This is Joy, I think it's Lohi. And uh, she's, a, she's a girl, 13 years old, writing this. Just what she writes. She says, uh, I'm a girl, 13 years old. I have, I have brown, brown eyes and hair. And in the eighth grade, I am five foot, one and a half inches tall. I like to ice skate, roller skate, and swim, and play the piano. I love animals, and I have a dachshund named Fritz. When you read this message, say a little prayer for me. Thank you, Joy. So, and we have another one from uh, Ben Nowak, and he's listing all the children, and then his 10 grandchildren as well. Wow. So for genealogists, this is great material. This was the packet that was found with the, another one of the packets found with the buck material, and it's a, almost like an Andy Warhol type of thing, if you think about it, stuff that was found in a desk drawer. It's a paper punch, a nutcracker. This, uh, there was a pair of these um, um, costume jewelry earrings. Unfortunately, the freeze between the water and the freezing process, the glue that holds those together separated and all these pieces were falling off of that. But you have a hair comb and a few other things, a curler. Um, so just, just some interesting stuff that was all bolt rubber banded together. Then we have something from Ann McFarland, and this one I thought was real interesting. Uh, lists all these, these kids with ages, and I don't know what to make of this one, but she says, howdy, y'all, glad to meet you. I hope, you. I hope to see you someday. If you are around Bay City, look me up, or look me. I'll, I'll have 12 children, cheaper by the dozen. I don't know who the man will be. We'll see. So I don't know if Jim, whose age is 22, is fictional or, uh, you know, anyway. So some of those little, and then this one, um, this was uh, Bertha Hanan, H-A-N-N-A-N, Hanan or Hanan, something like that. And she's uh, listing her children and then talks about um, things like the atomic age uh, now and, and things like that, talking to, the, to her children in the future, thinking probably that these children are gonna maybe get a chance to see this. All right, so what's next? What we've done with a lot of this material is we put them back into acid-free paper and then put them back in folders. So we've interleafed them so that acid-free paper acts, helps act as, act as a wick as it's freezing, put them back into the freezer and hopefully we can draw some more of that moisture out of there for some of those that we're having trouble with. 
but we're going to attempt to work on more of these at some point in the future here um, because this is there's a whole bunch in there and it'll be interesting to see what's what's there plus there's other packets of other material that we would like to go through as well because I know there's you know I'd always hoped that there, there were films taken of the 1965 centennial and uh, the programs that they had and I was always hope, hoping that maybe they thought to throw copies of those in there but there's lots of packets to look through so we'll see I, I don't know that's just a I have nothing to substantiate that. That was just a hope of mine, as they've never materialized. So, um, okay, so everybody, uh, grab your cards. I'm just interested in the kinds of things that you guys might have written. Who, who wrote about their family? Anybody write anything about their? A little bit. Okay. It's like DNA, we're looking at our ancestry nowadays. Okay. Anybody write about politics? No. Yeah, okay, one in a couple. How about peace? You don't want to hear about the politics. Peace, okay, wishing for peace. Um, what else did you write about? For the technology. technology? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. Hobby. Hobby, okay. Anybody want to share what they wrote? Go ahead. Uh, are we still driving cars and trucks on the roads, or is it all autonomous vehicle traffic? Self-driving vehicle traffic, computer tech used to control it, yes or no? Good. Anyone else want to share? Go ahead. We'll be using any cash. We'll be using any cash, okay. <laughs> Just a thumbprint or something. In the back. Well, the diseases that are run now, like AIDS and, and that, or like cerebral palsy like I had, or oh. any of the born diseases, will they be gone? Okay, that's... That's good. Anyone else want to share? Yes. I live at 1412 Center Avenue, and my address is 100 years old last year. And it was a big celebration, of course. And I wrote it, and I hope it's still there. Still there. Cool. Okay. Simmons Apartments. Simmons Apartments, yep. Okay, I know that. I know that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, you, you share a bit in common. Can you grab the light one more time? Because I want to leave you with this. So this is from, let me make sure I can get this right. Mrs. Barry Droptini. Some, Droptini. <coughs> yeah, Mrs. Barry Droptini. She wrote, to him it may concern, may the world in which you live be a place of joy. Today we worry of Vietnam, Russia, led and then it goes into some other things about history. I can't, there's that, this was one where the, you see the outline of the, the religious pamphlet and the, uh, the penny. So anyway, talking about some very similar things to what we're talking about today, troubles and things like that. So very interesting to, to see bringing that full circle. That's only, you know, 52 years, 53 years ago. So how we, you know, history has a way of repeating itself. So with that, um, I think that's my last one, hold on. Yes, it is. Any questions? Ralph Ron, when yeah. they make uh, pennies, they make them in layers. Mm -hmm. And the outside layer is copper, and the inside is an alloy of nickel and various other metals in there. And so when in the process of whatever happened with the water, mm -hmm. it's possible it froze and separated, separated. that way. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. That's... Any other questions, comments? Way in the back. Would that be like... A casket? Now think about that. Yeah, very well. Would that be like a casket is the comment. Yeah, it, it very well could be. But sometimes they open a casket and everything's fine. The body's there. Okay, help. Yeah. Explain. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. Well, had the, water, had the water not been in there, I think we would have been good. But um, with the water in there, that... that in, all kinds of issues. Yes? How do you determine if you're going to put this time back in the ground? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously they put it in the wrong place here. Um, you try to, well, you try to find a place that's going to have good sandy drainage and things like that, but there have actually been some that have built, uh, have put them inside of buildings and building foundations yeah. and things like that. I think, wasn't the, Korean? you were involved in the one for the public library back in, <coughs> around that time. They put it inside of the actual library. Um, and it's meant to be open. It's like a crypt almost within. So there's, 
Lots of different ways you can do it. I don't know that I would bury one in the ground, to be honest, after going through this. If it was something that maybe, I mean, we have them on, on the grounds of CMU. We, I, we also, I inherited one that was open in Rao Hall, which is our building. It was buried 19, in the 1950s when they put the building in 56, I believe. And it had the same problem, but it was a cornerstone box, lead, sealed, you know, sealed with lead. Um, and it had the same issue. We had a conservator work on that. That's why I know a little bit about how pricey having a conservator work with it can be. But it was a very small box compared with what this is. Uh, and it still was compromised. And we have multiples around campus that I have a feeling are probably just as potentially compromised. But in that case, they had, had it had been up on top of grade. It had been sitting up in a, a bot, in a stone, a cornerstone with the date on it. And when they did the handicap accessibility for the building, they actually put a concrete ramp right next to it. So it became, went from being at grade, or above grade to being at grade. And you know what happens with water, it always finds the, the lowest, the lowest resistance. So things like that can happen, you don't know, you know. I, so I, and there are a lot of time capsules out there that either A, have been buried and forgotten, or have been buried and people know they're there, they just don't know where they are, or that, you know, are gonna stay buried until somebody works on a building or, or finds it, that sort of thing. Yeah? With, with uh, knowing what I know about uh, uh, how things watertight and things like that, uh, the pressures that come from water mm -hmm. being exposed to it, there's no way to have a, a metal box or whatever and have it airtight mm -hmm. and not have it solid and not have it collapse or leak or spring leak somewhere in it. So it's inevitable anything below ground level mm -hmm. is compromisable. Well, they're, they're one of the things they were working on is a, a stainless steel capsules that are round. Yeah. So they have actually, they're cylinder shaped and they had screws, basically the two halves screw together. It looks like a giant um, capsule, like a giant aspirin capsule or something right. like that. And they would gasket it and it have enough rigidity in it that it would resist it. But those haven't been tested. They're in the ground now. A lot of those were buried around the, the 2000s. Yeah, those have to be egg shaped. Yeah. Uh, even a cylindrical, it still has a pressure point in the middle where it, mm -hmm. it, it can develop weakness. Right. You'd almost have to have an egg shape. Mm -hmm. You can stand on an ostrich egg, believe it or not, you can stand on them. Oh. They'll, hold the, they'll hold the person's weight standing on it. Okay. Yeah. What became of the uh, cinder block structure over at the county building? Was it filled in? Yep, they filled it in. Okay. They, we, were gonna, we were thinking about reburying something, and once we saw what was there, it obviously wasn't going back in the same place. So they, they did whatever they had to do. I, I'm assuming, I, I noticed there's grass back over top of it again, so. And it is, interestingly enough, it wasn't buried that far below grade, and they'd run electrical lines across the top of it and didn't even know it was there. Because mm -hmm. they had to cut some electrical lines for the, the lighting that was out there at the time they did it. It was a little more involved than what we thought it was gonna be. So, any other questions, comments? Yes. Are they going to rebury re another time capsule? Um, I don't think there's any plans at this point to do that. Um, I don't know how many more are around that need to be open, but um, we we had talked about doing it with this project, but then all the powers that were involved in it have all sort of since gone their separate ways. So probably not. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Excellent. It was good to talk to y'all. Thanks. A round of applause. Thank you.